The sleeping brain resembles a city at night. Certain functions are shut down, but others are quite active as the rich dream world of the imagination is constructed. But exactly how the brain creates a dream has long been a mystery. The breakthrough discovery of rapid eye movement sleep came in 1953 at the University of Chicago, where Eugene Azarinsky and Nathaniel Kleitman were studying the eye movements and brain waves of people as they fell asleep. The EEG charts showed that the sleeper's brain waves were very active and their eyes were moving rapidly beneath their closed lids. Kleitman and Azarinsky deduced that this active state of the brain during sleep was associated with dreaming. William DeMent confirmed their findings. This discovery kind of jolted everybody because the prevailing notion is that, that sleep is a time when the, when the brain turns off and the eyes moving as rapidly as they do in the waking state was just, you know, unexpected. Uh, then there were some other physiological changes, the heart rate increased, the breathing increased, and uh, Professor Kleitman had the sudden insight, maybe this is excitement of the dream. A pioneer in the field, Dement is also noted for having discovered the 90-minute human sleep cycle, which for most people recurs four or five times each night. Dement observed that newborns spend eight hours a day in REM sleep, and newborn kittens nearly the full 24 hours. Many scientists think that REM sleep in young creatures is crucial for the development of the central nervous system. It has also been discovered that the brain shuts down our muscles during dreaming. Except for our eyes, toes, and fingertips, we are effectively paralyzed during our dreams. Men experience erections during REM sleep and women an equivalent sexual arousal. But there is a rare group of people, mostly elderly men, who are anything but paralyzed during their dreams. When the motor inhibition of normal dreaming fails, victims of REM sleep behavior disorder attempt to act out their dreams. Many actually punch their spouses or injure themselves. Others, like Donald Dorf, just go out for the winning pass. One night I dreamt that I was playing football as the right halfback, and the play called for me to receive the ball laterally and make a cut and go over tackle. Um, there was a 260-pound tackle there waiting for me, so I says, I'll give him my shoulder and run around him. And I went to give him my shoulder, and that's when I hit the dresser and knocked everything off and broke the mirror and cut my head and woke up, of course. Ah, Mr. Dorf, so Doctor. good to see you again. Fortunately, researchers here at the Minnesota Regional Sleep Disorders Center have found that this strange condition can be effectively treated with medication. So the medication is still working pretty well. No one knows the exact cause, but scientists suspect it's neurological and related to aging. The sad thing is, since this disorder is so little known, it often goes misdiagnosed as a serious psychiatric illness. What is the brain doing while it's sleeping and dreaming? No one knows for sure, but there are many theories. Some scientists compare it to a computer that goes offline at night, closed to external inputs, but still quite busy downloading files used during the day. In 1983, Nobel Prize winner Francis Crick proposed that dreams are a kind of waste basket for the brain. He argued that we dream to forget, to reduce fantasy and obsessive, bizarre modes of thought. Dreams are a way for the networks of the brain to avoid gridlock. And the things we dream about may be better off forgotten. In 1977, Harvard University's Alan Hobson and Robert McCarley developed their theory of the dream generator. According to their hypothesis, 
The raw material of dreams comes from the random firing of neurons in a primitive part of the brain called the pons. These electrical signals travel up into the cortex. The cortex then attempts to construct a story to impose meaning on these chaotic impulses. It's as if the neurons firing provide a series of random dots and the cortex tries to connect those dots into a coherent picture. Hobson thinks that's often a hopeless task. The brain is always trying to impose meaning on whatever signal it gets, whether it comes from the outside world in waking or whether it comes from inside our heads during sleep. I mean, that's the job of the brain. It's a, the repository and creator of, of, of all meaning. And so when we're asleep and our brain turns on and we start receiving these goofy signals from inside our head, we think we're awake and we make up a story to go with it. By discounting the meaning of dreams, Hobson has aroused criticism from a generation of dream interpreters. While he doubts that dreams hold important meaning, he nevertheless markets a device he calls the nightcap that people can use at home to collect their dreams. The device detects eye movements and can be attached to an alarm clock. While Hobson enjoys tracking his own dreams, their chaotic raw material and bizarre shifts of scene lead him to doubt the validity of most dream interpretation. Well, I think it's a fool's errand, really. I mean, although I indulge in it myself, um, I have to admit that I don't really know what I'm doing when I set out to interpret a dream. And, and it, it seems to me that this is a kind of a very understandable human uh, uh, quality to want to understand the things, but maybe they don't have uh, any, any profound meaning. Uh, it's hard to imagine why we forget them if they're so all-fired important. Fool's errand or deadly serious? William Dement has personal reason to believe in the meaning of dreams. Years ago, I was a very, very heavy smoker, and I had this incredibly vivid dream. I had a cough, and one day I was coughing, and in the handkerchief there was some blood. Well, I had a chest X-ray. My friend, the radiologist, put the X-rays up on the viewing screen, I saw the cancer. And in that moment, I knew my life would soon end. And it was just overwhelming. I wouldn't see my children grow up, wouldn't see green grass. It was just tremendously powerful. And then I woke up and, oh man, I can still remember it. The relief was so real. Ah. A second chance was to be reborn, but the main thing was I had experienced cancer of the lung, and I knew that was a totally unacceptable alternative. I never smoked another cigarette. That dream saved my life. A powerful dream can affect us deeply, but is the meaning in the dream itself or in how we choose to interpret it? One sort of says, well, you bring the meaning to the dream, or is it intrinsic to the dream? Uh, one has to sort of step back from that and look at life and then recognize that in a very real sense, all of life can be looked at as meaningless. And the demand, if you will, on the person as you become a human being is to recognize that one infuses life with meaning, and that's what makes it tolerable and truly human. In the same way with dreams and dreaming, we all live with a system of meaning. And what we have to learn is how do we metaphorically express that meaning system in dreams so we can understand life and ourselves better.